Chapter 8 of the Singing Mouse Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Courtney Sandu. The Singing Mouse Stories by Emerson Howe. Chapter 8 At the Place of the Oaks. Do you know what the oak says? asked the singing mouse as it sat up on my knee. It had needed to nibble again at my fingers before it could waken me from the dream into which I had fallen, gazing at the fading fire. Do you know what the oak says? it repeated. Do you hear it? Do you hear the talking of the leaves? I know what the oak says, said the singing mouse. When the wind is soft, the oak says, Peace, peace. When the breeze is sharp, it sighs and says, Pity, pity, pity. And when the storm has fallen, the oak sobs and cries, Woe, woe, woe. Do you see the oaks? asked the singing mouse. Do you see the little lake? Do you know this place of the oaks? Behold it now. It waved a tiny hand. I gazed at the naked, cheerless wall, seamed and rent with cracks along its sallow width, and as I gazed, the seams and scars blended and composed into lines of a map of a noble country. And as I gazed more intently, the map took on a color, and narrowed its semblance to that of a certain region. And as I gazed yet more eagerly, the map faded quite away, and there lay in its stead the smiling face of an enchanted land. There was the little silver lake rippling on its shore of rushes. Around rose the long curved hills, swelling back from the shore. The baby river babbled on at the mouth of the lake, kissing its mother a continual farewell. The small springs tinkled metallically cold into the silver of the lake. The tender green of the gentle glades rolled softly back, dividing the two hills in peaceful separation. And there were the oaks. At the water's edge, near the lesser spring, the wild apple trees twisted, but upon the hills and over the great glades stood the reserved, mysterious oaks, tall and strong. One oak, a mighty one, now resolved itself more prominently forth. Did I not know it well? Could one forget the tortured but noble soul of this oak? Could one forget the strong arm of comfort it extended over this most precious spot of all the glade? One must suffer before one may comfort. The oak had suffered somewhere. We do not know all things. But over this spot the great tree reached out sheltering hands, and certainly from its hands dropped benedictions plenteously down. Near the small house of white, and under the oak's protecting arm, there burned a little flame of small compass save in the vast shadows it set dancing among the trees those who built this fire here so many times so many years each time first craved pardon of the green grass of that happy glade for they would not harm the grass but the grass said yea to all they that asked this was sure for each year the tiny hearth spot was greener than any other spot because it remembered what the fire had said and done. And each year the oak dropped down food enough for the little fire. The oak took pay in the vast shadows the fire made for it. That was the way the oak saw the spirits of the past. And when it saw them it sighed, but still it welcomed the shadows of the past. So the fire and the grass and the oak and the shadows of the past were friends, and each year they met here. It had been thus for many years. Each year for many years the same hand had laid the little fire in the same place, and so given back to the oak its past. Now the past is a very sad but tender thing. Nearby the little fire I saw a small table formed of straight laid boughs, and at either side of this were seats made cunningly in the workshop of the woods. There were two forms at this small table. I saw them both. One was gray and bowed somewhat, stooped as the oaks are, silvered as the oaks are in the winter days. The other was younger and more erect. 
Once the younger looked to the older for counsel, but now, it seemed to me, the bowed figure turned to the one that had become more strong. I saw the savory vapors rise. Even, it seemed to me, I could note a faint, clear odor of innocent potency. I saw the table laid, not with gleam of snow and silver, but with plain vessels, which nevertheless seemed now to have a radiance of their own. I knew all this. It was as though there actually lay at hand those pleasant scenes, as though there actually arose the appealing fragrance of the evening meal. Now, as I looked, the gray figure bowed its head, there under the arm of the oak, and asked on the humble board the blessing of the God, who made the oak, and gave the fire, and spread the pleasant waters on the land. Every meal-time, every year, for many years, it had been thus. Ever the oak knew, the gray figure would first bow and ask the blessing of God, and each time at the close the oak with rustling leaves pronounced distinct, Amen. Let those jest who will, I do not know. I think perhaps the oak knows, or it would not thus, for years have whispered reverently its distinct amen. I will not scoff. It is perhaps we who are ignorant. We do not know all things. I ask not what nor who were these two who had come each year to this place of the oaks, but surely they were friends. In shadow I could hear them talk. In shadow I could see them smile. These friends sat by the little fire, a time before they went to rest in the tiny house of white. After they had gone, the fire did strange things. All men know that, though you see the fire burn down, when you go into the tent, you will sometime in the night see the walls lit up by a sudden flash or so now and then, from the fire which was thought to be dead. That is the business of the fire, and of the oaks, and of the shadows. I know that the shadows dance strangely, and hover and come near at hand in those late hours of the night. But what then occurs I do not know. These two friends never questioned this. They knew it was the secret of the night, and gave the oak its own request in pay for its protection and consent. They gave the oak its union with the sacred past. In the night I have heard the oak sob. Yet in the morning, when the sun was silvering the wake of all the leaping fishes, the oak was always gentle, and it said, Wake, wake, God is wise. Waken, waken, God is good. As pure shining beads upon a thread of gold, I saw this small dear picture, reiterant and unchanged, year after year, always with the same calm and pure surroundings. Only as year added itself to year, slipping forward on the golden string, I saw the gray figure grow more gray, more bowed, more feeble. Alas, it seemed to me I saw the silver coming upon the head of the younger man, and his eyes growing weary, as one who looks at the earth too closely, which is not wise to do. Yet the years came to the oaks, and to the grasses, and to the friends. The grass dies every year, but it is born again. The oak dies in centuries, but it is born again. Man dies in threescore years and ten, but he too is born again. As I looked, I could see the passing of the years. In all but the unaltering fire of friendship, I could see change creeping on. Grayer, grayer, more bent, more feeble. Is it not so, singing mouse? And now, this time, what was this gentle warning that the oak tried to whisper softly down? Perhaps the grayer friend heard it as he sat musing by the fire. He rose and looked about him, as one who had dreamed and was content. He looked up at the solemn stars, unafraid, and so murmured to himself, Day unto day uttereth speech, he said. Night unto night showeth knowledge. Day unto day, singing mouse, day unto day. Woe is me, singing mouse, and these are bitter tears, for that which you have shown I see it all again, the oaks, the glade, the tiny house of white, the small pleasant fire. Here again is the little table, and here is the evening meal. The table is still spread for two. A double portion is served as it was wont before. Yet why? For all is not the same. At this table there is but one form now. 
the younger man is there, although now he has grown gray and stooped. Year into year, day into day, the beads have slipped along the string. Once young, now old, he keeps the camp alone. But is he then alone? Hush! The squirrels have grown still, and even the oak is silent. What is that opposite across the table, at the seat long years held only by the elder of these two? Tell me, Singing Mouse, is it not true that I see there, sitting as of old at the table, the same sturdy form, the same simple, innocent, and believing face? It is the gray ghost of one grown gray in goodness. It is the shadow of a shadow, the apparition of a soul. The one at the table pauses as was the wont before the beginning of a meal. He looks across the table to the shadow, as if the shadow were his friend. The shadow bows its head. The living man bows also his head at the board. The shadow moves its lips. Doubt not those words are heard this day. See, the sun rises through the trees. The glorious day sets on once more. Doubt not, fear not, sorrow not, ye two. Bow the head still, ye two, and do not let my picture perish. Whisper again the benediction of the years, and let me hear once more the murmur of the oaks. Amen. The End of Chapter 8